Welcome everyone to Looking Forward, Post-COVID Arts Funding and Opportunities. Um, at this point, I wanna turn things over to Ara Beal to welcome us and get us started. Thanks, Elaine. Um, my name is Ara Beal and I'm the Executive Director at Tailspinner Children's Theater. And together with Neighbor Up here in Cleveland, we were able to uh, get some funding to bring Elaine and talk to Cleveland-based artists. Well, I guess artists actually, we've had people from, from further in Cleveland for sure. Um, about some of the special changes that artists are facing as we're coming out of COVID, particularly around their finances, because that is what Elaine does. So um, we're glad to be hosting this third session. All three sessions are available as recordings on our YouTube channel. Um, you can find them also on our, on our website, which is tailspinnercle.com. Org. Um, and I think they're also on Facebook and, and other places. You can also always, of course, reach out. Um, but if you haven't finished your taxes yet, because if I'm right, Elaine, they're due in 11 days. Our first session about preparing for your taxes, it's probably going to be really helpful to you. So uh, now might be a good time to go back and watch that one if you missed that. And that's, that's it, Elaine. That sounds great. And and thanks for the tax plug. Um, it is, I, you know, it's always a good time to talk about taxes, in my opinion. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, that deadline rapidly approaching, uh, it, it is now, now is the time. Um, so as Eris said, my name's Elaine. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, and I am joining you from Dublin, Ohio, which is Kashkashkia and Hopewell indigenous and cultural lands. And in case you're listening, instead of watching, I'll share a visual description of myself. I am a 40-ish year old white woman with wavy blondish brownish hair. And I'm wearing a black jacket today in front of one of my favorite uh, blue paintings full of lots of movements by a woman named Heather Reese, who's kind of amazing. Um, I am a CPA by training and I hold a personal financial specialist designation and I'm an accredited financial counselor, all of which is to say we can talk about taxes, we can talk about budgeting and investments and long term retirement planning, and we can address the human side of all of those things because as we know money is never really about the money it's often about a whole lot more than the money, especially in the arts. I do have the great privilege of working with incredible organizations all across the country, helping individual artists with the business side of their creativity. I work with funders and colleges and universities and state and city arts councils and all sorts of other groups supporting visual, literary, and performing artists. And it is, again, such a pleasure to be able to be doing this work. As we dive into today's content, we want to make sure you feel comfortable both taking space and making space. So we have a handful of questions that were submitted in advance. We'll definitely make sure to address. And if you would like to submit a question in real time using the chat feature, that's a really good way to do this. And if you're listening later and you still have additional questions, you can always reach out. We are all equal parts teachers and learners in this space. So if you hear something that really resonates with you and feels like it might make sense with your practice, you should take that and use it in a way that works for you. But it's also possible that I'll share some ideas that don't really feel like they're a fit. You're the expert in your own experience. So you get to decide how you take this information and make it work for you. And then lastly, if there are stories that are shared as part of this, we want to make sure that we are honoring the space and leaving the stories here, uh, but by all means, take the lessons from those stories and carry them with you. Um, this is being recorded, so keep that in mind if you are sharing any sort of personal anecdotes. And even though I'm a CPA and I love talking about taxes, everything in this workshop is educational and not meant to be used as tax, legal, or accounting advice. So, you know, today we're talking about funding, right, especially as we are all emerging from this moment in time, but we wanted to start by sort of going over uh, some numbers and some metrics about the overall financial impact and touch on some maybe ideas about what the next six to 12 months might look like financially based on some industry projections. And then we're going to strategize some actionable solutions to a lot of uncertainty and some pretty big financial problems that we all have been experiencing. I do not have to tell you that times are tough in the arts right now. The industry overall has lost about $15.2 billion. That's the economic impact estimated on the industry by Americans for the Arts. 
Americans for the Arts has been doing some pretty heroic research in identifying the impact of the pandemic on the arts sector overall. And I'd encourage you to dive into that research if you aren't already familiar with it. You'll see references at the bottom of many of these slides. And of course, afterwards, you'll be getting a copy of the slide deck. So you can certainly um, dive into that in more detail if you're curious. When it comes to arts organizations, the median loss is $30,000. So that means as many organizations have lost more than that as have lost less than that amount, which can be pretty impactful depending on the size of your organization. 96% of organizations canceled events. I'm actually surprised this isn't 100% of organizations given how trying the past year has been, but this is an overwhelming number. And you think about the amount of events that were canceled that this 96% represents and all the humans that were affected by those cancellations. And that really makes it clear how severe this impact was. And 72% of organizations have modified their operations in some way, shape, or form. Here's what that means uh, for some organizations. About 30% uh, had layoffs. They let staff go as part of this pandemic. About 35% imposed some sort of pay cut on some of their full-time individuals. Sometimes this was through reductions of hours. Sometimes this was through reductions of salaries. Um, but pay cuts were definitely something imposed by 35% of organizations. About 45% of organizations used their reserves. So they may have had accumulated surpluses from previous years, or they may have some sort of reserve fund or, or access to some sort of emergency type of relief uh, that they dipped into, which is incredible for those organizations that had those resources. And of course, we know that is not a sustainable solution because as a, those reserves are used, they go down and disappear. So we need to make sure we are replenishing them to maintain the health of our organizations long term. And then over 70% of organizations pivoted online and used a lot of really interesting and creative strategies to take their programming online. And what's interesting to me is that 67% of those organizations plan to continue online in some capacity, which I find kind of delightful. We all know that Zoom fatigue is real and you and I have probably both sat in performances online, some of which were fantastic and some of which really kind of struggled uh, to meet quality standards. But I think there are also some pretty wonderful things that emerged as part of this pivot online, forced and rapid as it may have been. I think in a lot of ways, we were able to reach more diverse audiences, certainly geographically diverse audiences, but also individuals that may not have been able to normally access a theater uh, or have access to public transportation to get to an art event, right? Or access to childcare to enable them to attend an art event. So I think in a lot of ways, this pivot online really has broadened those we serve in really interesting and powerful ways. And I think what we're seeing are arts organizations recognize that there are some really good things as part of that broadened access that we probably want to hang on to, especially now that we've learned some lessons about how to operate online in a really authentic and effective way. What's also unique about this particular crisis, and if you've been in the industry for a while, you know, we, we have crises in the arts, right? This is not the first one we've had. But what's special about this one is that this pandemic impacted every single funding source that arts organizations normally have. You see data here on the slide from the National Endowment for the Arts on how the United States funds the art, broken down into different categories. About 15% comes from interest earned or endowment income from organizations. About 40% comes from earned income, so ticket sales or admission fees. And then the balance, about 45%, comes from contributed sources, donations from individuals, corporations, foundations, or governmental entities. And again, your organization might have a slightly different pie chart than this one, but what we see overwhelmingly in performing arts groups and museums is that this breakdown pretty much makes sense for many, many organizations. And every single aspect of that pie chart was impacted. 
Our earned income was impacted because of closures and canceled events or performances or festivals that didn't happen. And especially as we modified operations in order to continue to serve the community or to continue to offer art in some way, shape or form, many of those events were offered on a contribution basis or offered for free to the communities of those we serve. So they weren't necessarily replacing the earned income that was lost by not having the event in the first place. We know our donors, individuals, corporations, and foundations were also feeling economic pressure and economic challenges. Again, this moment in time affected every single industry and every single individual, which is not usual for major economic impacts, right? This was a big one. And so in addition to individuals, corporations, and foundations feeling that economic pressure, they were also, in many cases, realigning their values. That doesn't mean they weren't still supportive of the arts, but they may have felt, especially in the early parts of 2020, that giving to food pantries or social services or other organizations that were meeting very immediate human survival needs may have been a better use of their resources at the time. And of course, as 2020 continued and we saw growing Black Lives Matter movement protests all across the country, many individuals, corporations, and foundations directed their resources towards those efforts as well. Again, not because the arts aren't important, but because other things were important as well, which means some of the resources left the arts in order to go to those very crucial issues. We know governmental funding has fluctuated. There has been a lot of relief coming through governmental sources and our cities and states that often rely on tax revenue, especially from tourism dollars or bed taxes imposed on hotel room stays, right? That revenue was severely curtailed last year because people weren't traveling, events weren't happening. One of the first cities to cancel a hugely major event was Austin, Texas, when South by Southwest was canceled. And the city was pretty candid about the amount of lost revenue canceling that event meant for the city. And a whole lot of that revenue would normally fund grants to artists and arts organizations in Austin. So as we watch kind of the tide of that impact of lower tax revenue continue to roll over the next couple of years, I think it's reasonable to expect that despite the increased emergency governmental aid that was flowing through many sources this year, our cities and states are going to continue to face economic pressure, which means those grants might not be as easy to get as they have historically been. And in a lot of cases, they have not been historically easy to get. So that's something to kind of pay attention to as well. And then of course, when it comes to investment returns and endowments, Yes, we've seen market movements going up, but there is also a lot of uncertainty happening in investment world right now, especially with the introduction of uh, NFTs and some other sort of digital products that, you know, not all financial investors are super comfortable with. So I think there will continue to be some uncertainty there. All of which is to say, this is at a huge impact on every single funding source and the impact will probably continue be, to be seen for a period of time. One of the registration questions that came in um, was about hopes that there might be for federal grants given to theaters for reimbursing larger companies post pandemic. And related to that, is there any relief for gig theater workers on the horizon? Uh, and I will say candidly, I am not hearing a whole lot about additional relief that might be coming from the federal government. I think there will continue to be a lot of discussions around what the next economic priorities might be, whether that is in protecting tenants uh, from evictions. There's been some recent uh, action in the court system related to that whether it's going to be related to permanent student loan forgiveness, especially as these loans continue to be in forbearance through September 30th, or through 
another round of stimulus payments, perhaps, or increasing the federal minimum wage, perhaps. So I think we'll continue to pay attention and watch what some of this potential conversation and legislation might lead to. But I am not hearing necessarily right now that there's going to be a whole lot of relief on the horizon. I think if you are a theater company or a gig worker, um, you are probably aware of a lot of the existing resources, um, the shuttered venue operator grants for sure. Uh, PPP2, uh, I believe, uh, just shut down yesterday. Um, so hopefully you you got your application in if, if that was something you were considering. Um, and of course, the employer retention tax credits uh, that run through your payroll forms um, has been really helpful to a lot of organizations. And for individuals, that expanded unemployment has now been expanded and extended a number of times. So, so that still might be a reasonable option for you. Most of that was about arts organizations, but I would be remiss not to point out that things are really hard for creative individuals right now as well. Almost 95% have lost income, and the average loss has been $12,394. Depending on your segment of the industry, your loss may have been quite a bit larger than this. We know many individual artists, especially those connected with performance world, were really heavily impacted. And some were able to shift into new applications of their creativity. We saw um, musicians in many cases moving into recorded music type of work. Um, I saw a few actors uh, take up voice recording work, um, which was never something they had planned to do. So we saw some creative pivot in that may have helped mitigate some of these average losses, but it, it was bad, especially for certain segments of the creative industry. And what individuals did to survive last year was amazing and heroic, but it's probably not sustainable. You see here, uh, overwhelmingly, individuals applied for relief, generally in the form of grants or some sort of other emergency relief option. A number also applied for unemployment thanks to that expanded unemployment that made gig workers and freelancers and self-employed individuals eligible for unemployment. But of course we know unemployment has an end to it for the number of weeks you can claim unemployment in secession and the emergency reliefs grants have mostly already been spent. So those solutions are not long-term solutions and they're not sustainable. But I think there is reason to be optimistic when it comes to looking specifically at the music segment of the industry. 2020 was brutal. There was a 25% revenue loss according to Goldman Sachs industry-wide projections, but Goldman's predicting a strong rebound in 2021 and 6% growth per year in the music industry over the next nine years or so, which is pretty good. That is not, you know, astronomical growth, but that's stable growth that feels pretty good. It's stable growth on a smaller base, so we want to make sure we're not overly rosy here about this, but for our musician friends, this feels pretty good. We also know in visual art world, um, there are a lot of trends that people are embracing. Um, but there was a great article about kind of what's on the horizon for visual arts world in 2021. And the phrase bricks and clicks came up and really struck with me. Um, this idea that galleries and museums are maintaining physical spaces and maintaining them safely, but also exploring what it looks like to maintain a digital presence as well and how that will affect how individuals consume and embrace visual art. We're going to continue to see event-driven market growth, particularly around festivals and other major events. And we're seeing a whole lot of new and interesting technology usage, especially in visual arts when it comes to NFTs in particular, but also what it looks like to kind of monetize this intellectual property and, and what that means. Now, this is a little bit still the wild, wild west uh, of the art world right now, but it's a really interesting wild, wild west. And I'm hearing really fantastic stories about people who are starting to dabble in this area and experience explore what this might look like. We'll have some more clarity on it long term, but we're really leaning into digital in a lot of ways while also 
preserving that physical space and the event driven moments in time. So what does all that mean for you? What should you actually do? This was one of the questions that came in, not surprisingly. And, and this person shared, I'd like to know what things a seasoned artist should do trying to make a mark for themselves. What should they be focused in on during the building of their career? And, and I love this question because the answer to this would be probably the same whether or not we were in the middle of a global pandemic. But since we're in the middle of a global pandemic, I think it makes sense, no matter where you are in your career, to reassess a few things. So here's what I would suggest as the four things you might think about doing, and we'll walk through each of these in detail. And I have some examples of groups and individuals who have dabbled in these areas and, and figured out kind of how to dabble in them well. And the first thing to do is define, or in some cases, redefine your value as a creator. And this to me is a really useful exercise to do, especially during times of transition, but also kind of regularly in your career because things change over time. So what I mean by this is getting really clear on what you do so that if someone asks you that question, what do you do? you have a pretty clear answer that's ready to go. Now, most of the time when people are asked the question, what do you do? They respond with a noun. They give sort of their title. I'm an artist, I'm a musician, I'm a photographer, I'm a dancer, I'm a CPA, right? We comfortably fall into the idea of providing a noun in answer to the question, what do you do? And that's perfectly fine. It is accurate and true in many cases. It's also probably what shows up on your tax form, but it's not super descriptive and it doesn't really convey the value of what you do. But then on the opposite end of the spectrum, sometimes, we give way too much information, right? This would be your artist bio, your musician bio, your full mission and vision statement if you're an organization, right? Many times these longer descriptions are way too long. In some cases, they're very technical and only of interest to others who are sort of deeply immersed in the world that you're in. So it doesn't really make sense to use something like that to answer the question, what do you do? So we're looking for kind of this Goldilocks answer in the middle that gives more description and hones in on the more value you provide as opposed to just the noun on your tax form but is concise and edited enough to make sense to someone who is maybe just casually interested in what you do. And in entrepreneurship world, we would call that a unique value proposition, which is a super entrepreneurial term that might make you a little uncomfortable, but stick with me because we're gonna break down each of those words in order. The unique part is what makes you different? What makes you special? What are the unique attributes you bring to your work, right? Value is what you do to change the world or for whom you do it. And proposition is basically how you're going to do it. So if we take that idea, a unique value proposition and break it down into your strengths, what makes you different, very clearly what you do for whom and then how you do it, all of a sudden it doesn't feel like a strange entrepreneurial term. It feels like something we can attack. And it's important to note that the context really does matter here, especially when we're looking at the value you provide and how you do it. Because the things that make you unique and special probably haven't changed over the past year. You still have all of the same strengths and talents and techniques that you had before the pandemic. In fact, if anything, you've probably added strengths and skills to your resume during the pandemic. But what you do may have changed and how you do it may definitely have changed. So it's okay to reassess this given this current moment in time, especially as you're thinking about what you might want this to be six months from now or one year from now after we have continued to emerge from this global pandemic. 
So if we were to break this down even further, I would challenge you to spend some time thinking about your strengths. You'll see there's a box here for you to list them out. They can be personal or professional or creative. It's really completely up to you. And there's a spot here to list your weaknesses as well, just in case you feel like they need to be captured somewhere. But I will note that there's probably about two or three times as much space to list your strengths as there is to list your weaknesses. And get clear on what these are, because these impact the prices you set for your work or your time, but they also impact the answer to the question, what do you do, so that you can describe what you can bring to organizations or partners as you continue to search for new opportunities. Thinking about your value is where we find a really good action verb to describe what you do. And we can think about who you serve with what you do as well, which again, may have changed at this moment in time. And that's okay. But let's get really clear on what that is and what you want it to be so that again, we can evaluate opportunities that might come your way. Thinking about who you serve as well is also absolutely crucial, especially as we start to identify different partnerships that might make sense for you and different clients you might want to work with, especially if there is overlap in who you serve and who they might serve. And then the proposition piece is the how. How are you going to do what you do? And what does that look like? What have you learned over the past year about how you do what you do? And how has it changed? As we go through and brainstorm all of those different things, eventually we'll pull those pieces together to a one or two sentence summary of what you do. And the point of this is not to give all the information about everything you could possibly do, but it's to start a conversation about the value you could bring. It's also important to really get clear on some high impact words that really, really describe the value that you provide without feeling like you're being especially pompous or cheesy, right? Because this has to feel authentic to you as a creator. It has to be something that you are comfortable saying out loud in conversation or putting on your website or putting at the top of a grant application, if that makes sense for you, right? So it has to sound like you. And you might have lots of different ones, especially if you find yourself as a performer and a teaching artist, for example. You might have a unique value proposition for your performance work and one for your teaching artist work, and that's okay. I have some examples here about uh, unique value propositions that students and clients have developed over the years. And I will say none of them started out where you see them on the screen. They started out much longer and much rougher. And then we went through rounds and rounds of editing to kind of distill them into this place. But where they ended up is pretty powerful. One organization shared, we provide human connection between the audience and the creators which is pretty powerful. Another individual said, I disrupt the expected environment with large scale installations, which is so much more interesting than saying I make big art, right? Uh, I disrupt the expected environment tells me so much more about what they create rather than just saying I make big art. Another individual said, I explore racial and gender binaries through documentary photography. And that's a really interesting one, too, because, again, it says so much with very few words. Someone else, a musician, said, I inspire young composers by mixing Lady Gaga and Bach. Yes, they are a music teacher, but that's not really what they do. What they do is inspire young composers by mixing Lady Gaga and Bach in unexpected ways. And then lastly, uh, an animator shared, I facilitate meaningful experiences by creating cozy video games, which again, tells me so much more about the value they bring to their creation, as opposed to saying, I design video games. There's nothing wrong with designing video games. It's a great industry, but I facilitate meaningful experiences by creating cozy video games, tells me much more about them as a creator. So I'd encourage you to hone in on your unique value proposition and really define your value clearly as an organization or an individual. 
And then once you've got it, we want to look for opportunities to use that unique value proposition and to use your strengths. This is a breakdown of more or less how individual artists get paid in the United States. And again, this is data from Americans for the Arts. Overwhelmingly, individuals pay artists, whether this is purchasing work or hiring them for services, right? Individuals often pay artists. But they're not the only group. For-profit companies, both creative for-profit companies and non-creative for-profit companies pay artists as well. A creative for-profit company could be a film studio, it could be a gallery, it could be a design firm or an architecture firm, and a non-creative for-profit company could be a hotel or a restaurant, a bank, a financial institution, right? So there, there are a lot of businesses out there that could fall in that non-creative for-profit category. Nonprofits pay artists as well. There are creative nonprofits. All of our arts organizations and um, local uh, museums and other nonprofit arts organizations for sure operate here. Symphonies, chamber groups, et cetera, et cetera. But there are non-creative nonprofits as well. Hospitals, for example, or uh, food banks or social service organizations. Then we know educational institutions hire artists, both as teachers, but also as guests that come in for various learning experiences. And then governmental entities offer grants to artists as well. So the real question then becomes, which of your strengths do these groups need? You've got your unique value proposition. You've honed in on what it really is. How does it align with these different groups, especially if you're looking at your own financial information and saying, you know what, I don't have any for-profit clients. Why don't I have any for-profit clients, right? There could be opportunities here to explore applying your unique value proposition to clients or potential clients in these different categories. Personally, I see a lot of opportunity in expanding your work with individuals. I think this will continue to be a strong area. And we know as part of kind of the not so secret secret of the pandemic is that there are a lot of individuals that are doing just fine financially and economically right now. There are a lot who are struggling tremendously but there are some who are doing just fine, right? So there is opportunity in serving individuals right now but it does take some time. I also see so much potential for creative individuals serving non-creative for-profit companies. Now, this could be something relatively easy, like uh, if you're a graphic designer doing logo work for banks and financial institutions, or it could be something more creative. What would it look like if you were a musician and you partnered with a, a hotel to offer a music series featuring local musicians and you were paid as the administrator or organizer of the series and you also performed and brought in other friends to perform as well? What would that look like? How could that partnership make sense for you? I also think there will continue to be opportunities in creative nonprofits as well, but the rebound might be slow. Remember, every single source of funding for our not-for-profit organizational friends was impacted by this pandemic, which means if you are an individual artist looking to apply your unique value proposition, continue to look for opportunities in creative nonprofits, but maybe look for additional opportunities as well. Recently, also, lots of people have been paying attention to non-creative nonprofits, especially in the healthcare industry. So we're seeing more and more programs for uh, art therapy type of things happening at hospitals and healthcare facilities, and also music integration programs and other craft programs happening at some of our nonprofit, non-creative organizations. So if that feels like it might represent opportunity for you, that's probably something to explore. And what that also means, as you're looking for those opportunities, is probably leaning into some online options. The ideas that I've seen getting the most traction, and again, not all of these might work perfectly for you, 
but the ideas that I've seen getting the most traction that are working well for a lot of individuals and groups are shared fundraising events, virtual auctions, and then using really creative strategies to convert earned income to contributed income. So a shared fundraising event uh, might look like something I was part of last summer, where an artist set up a print sale, and they had existing inventory, they were looking to unload, they were looking to make some money because all of their festivals where they would normally sell work had been canceled. So they partnered with an educational organization that does work in the prison system that also had felt some financial strain because they weren't able to get in and collect any of the earned income from delivering programs last year. So the artist said, let me do a print sale. We'll promote it to all of your supporters organization and we'll split all the proceeds 50-50. There was a natural markup to the pricing because this was designed as a fundraiser as opposed to just a print sale. And the artist enabled was enabled to grow his group of support among these new potential fans of his work. The organization benefited by getting some much needed contribution and the artist was able to get some cash and clear out his studio a bit, right? Everyone wins in that situation. We've also seen virtual auctions do better than expected. Um, we There's one organization I work with locally uh, that far exceeded what they thought they would raise from a virtual auction, in part because they really leaned into technology. They invested in this amazing app. The fees were very high, but the app was constantly creating this buzz around different items within the auction, and it was texting people when they were outbid. And so this organization saw that the level of engagement of the donors was a lot higher during this virtual auction, which was kind of nice. So they created this whole moment around this, and they were spotlighting how major donors and board members were going along and bidding against each other. And, and they called out some really interesting stories as part of this event. And I think it lasted for about seven days. So it was also time bound. And it was kind of nice. They're launching another one with high expectations again. And now many more of the items are including pandemic safe experiences. So these might be private dining moments that are happening uh, with particular restaurants, or they could be backstage tours of different theater companies. Even though the theater might still be dark, a winner of this particular item might be able to go in with a small group of friends and have a backstage tour kind of thing. So there could be opportunities here where everyone wins, especially if the organization collects the proceeds and then shares those proceeds with the restaurant where there is a pandemic safe dining experience provided or something like that. Because now is not the time for organizations to necessarily be asking for businesses to donate those type of experiences. Because especially if the business is in the restaurant or hospitality industry, they've been hit real hard right now. So thinking about ways to make this really a strong financial benefit for both parties can be a really good option. And then lastly, this idea of sort of really being creative around the value you provide and how you're continuing to engage with those you serve. Uh, so one organization was creating digital care packages. This was the organization whose unique value proposition was all about connecting performers to audience members, right? They haven't been able to do that because they haven't been able to perform in over a year, but that doesn't mean they still can't create some sort of connection. So they were creating digital care packages to foster that connection and inviting individuals to purchase digital care packages that would be then delivered to somebody else. Sort of like a greeting card, except it was a very artistic greeting card that was showing up in someone's inbox. And it ended with an invitation for them to then send a digital care package to someone else. 
We've also seen lots of groups play around what with pay what you can or pay what you want type of models. These have been around for a really long time, but more and more organizations really leaned into them during the pandemic because there wasn't a whole lot of rules around what people would be willing to pay for an online experience. A music group I work with that's based in New York was playing around with this model and they were finding that they were doing a weekly music series all with a pay what you want kind of model and there were suggested donation amounts right it is pay what you want but they were still anchoring people's perceptions around what might be a reasonable amount to pay. And they were finding they were collecting two to $300 on average per week, which was a pretty nice take that they were then splitting with the performers. Now, is that going to solve all of their financial woes? No, not at all. But they were building up their audience. They were getting lots of information about what people were willing and able to pay. And they have long-term plans to continue to use some of that momentum, even as they return to in-person performances. And then, of course, we know that some industries are doing okay. Financial services is doing just fine. Logistics is doing okay. The pharmaceutical industry is doing okay. So if there are opportunities to partner with those industries or offer some sort of sponsorship or some sort of creative experience for them to provide to their employees, there could be something interesting there that might make sense as well. So as you're thinking about these, and again, these ideas may or may not make sense for you, but as you're thinking about them, start exploring the community connections that you already have and review what you do well digitally and what you do not do well digitally because people are tired. The online fatigue is very real and this might not be the moment where this makes sense for you but keep exploring these community connections and see if there's an opportunity to match your strengths with a business or a client or a partner or an organization that needs or values those strengths, especially in some sort of digital capacity. And then my last idea is to forge partnerships. And we tend to be pretty good at this in the arts. So now's the time to continue to expand those partnerships in really authentic ways that make sense. The arts or the impact areas of interest to donors tends to be food insecurity and social justice right now. So if that's the case, what sort of partnerships can we establish with organizations and entities and individuals that are doing that work in a way that can be really beneficial to everyone involved? And to be abundantly clear, this is not just something to check off a list. These have to be authentic community connections and partnerships. So we want to make sure these are really deeply held relationships as opposed to seeking out an opportunity for something that's popular right now. And there are two examples of groups that are doing this really well. And these might feel familiar to you because again, this is not a brand new idea. We just might be thinking about this idea in a slightly different way, given this moment in time. There's an organization in Toronto. It's an arts in the parks organization that uh, spotlights food banks and local arts organizations at the same time, which is really powerful. So what would this look like in your organization or in your hometown? Is this a partnership with a farmer's market or is this leaning into a grocery store experience and adding some creativity to it? Is it a pop-up dance or musical performance that happens outside at a grocery store. I don't know, but there could be something interesting that's happening here. And then one of my other favorite examples is with a mobile food pantry in the Cleveland area. This is a food truck essentially, but it's a food bank or food pantry truck that drives around uh, and has pop-up food bank type of events. But instead of making them 
food bank only type of events, this organization invites artists and musicians and performers to be part of these pop-up events so that it is a real community engagement type of moment. So families can have the resources they need, their kids can have a creative experience, there's music, it has more of a block party kind of atmosphere in a way that really supports the community. And given that more families than ever are making use of food banks and food pantries, there's a really interesting opportunity here to feed bodies and souls through these type of events. So, my suggestion would be if you're thinking about partnerships that might make sense for you, go back through your records and think about any events you've participated in or any groups you've worked with in the past three or so years, right? Don't think about 2020 because it was a strange year, right? But maybe 2019, 2018, who was at the other festivals you were attending? Who else performed in venues where you performed? Who else was listed as sponsors of different events you participated in, right? Go through that list and identify any potential partners there that you already have some sort of tangential connection with, because there could be some community overlap there that it makes sense to explore. And it bears repeating, this is not just a checklist item, right? This is an opportunity to really forge some deep, meaningful connections between you and your community in a way that will eventually expand earned and contributed revenue opportunities, and more importantly, really serve yourself and your community and the partner in a tangible way. So that was a lot of information to take in. I've been keeping an eye on the chat and I haven't seen any additional questions come in, but by all means, if you have additional questions, now's the time to plop them into the chat. Because our recap for the day is that times are tough. The outlook is good. We see hope on the horizon, but things are still tough. And we will probably continue to see some of the impact of this long term. We'll continue to see individuals collect unemployment, but that's going to run out. And we will continue to see individuals have student loans be in forbearance, but that's going to run out too. So we, there is lots of reason to be optimistic and times are still tough. So one of the key things that you can do, regardless of where you are in your career as an individual or an organization, is define or possibly redefine your value. Focus on what you do really well and how it has and has not changed during this moment in time. And then use that value proposition and match it with different opportunities that might exist based on how individual artists get paid, based on partnerships that might make sense for you or your organization, and based on everything we've learned about leaning into digital or online opportunities and interesting things that might emerge based on what we've learned here. And of course, all of this is rooted in community because the arts are a massive unifier. So continue to forge those community connections and expand what you do and whom you serve in really powerful ways. That's what I've got. I'll go ahead and pause here in case there are additional questions. Uh, by all means, feel free again to share them in the chat or go ahead and share them out loud. We'll call them out. Uh, but it has been a pleasure spending some time with you today. Thanks so much for those of you who attended live and those of you who will be watching the recording later. And uh, keep me posted on all the great things you will do.